Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, thank you to Bart Dat, who's obviously done a fantastic job to keep going through this. Um, this is the last day, and the message I'm taking from you is much of the other else is that this should be fun. So let's make it a bit of fun. Today is the 4th of May. Of course, that is Star Wars Day. So what better excuse than to have some outrageous puns, and you will be free to groan, laugh, or cry. We'll see. So bear with me. These are the talks you're looking for. Today, we're going to have some wonderful speakers. I'm not going to mention everyone, but a few key ones that fit in with what we're going to do. We have, wait for it, Luke Chewy. Our lunchtime session is going to be given by Hans Marco. Thank you. I wrote these all myself. Um, and finally, if you don't behave, we will turn to the dark side with Darth Carla Maul. <laughs> and as you can tell, it is Star Wars Day because apparently with our IT system, there is a disturbance in the force. So hopefully we will see how it goes. But enough messing around. I'm going to turn over to the Princess Leia of Perfusion, Tammy Rosenthal. That was a great opening. I love the uh, fourth excitement that we'll uh, experience today. For our first presentation in this session, I would like to introduce Luke Puy. Luke did his tr perfusion training in Belgium. He was involved in student education and mentoring. Um, his interest in perfusion education led him into different active roles in the Belgian Society for Extracorporeal Technology. Luke was a member of the European Board, was the Quality and Outcomes Outcomes Subcommittee Chair and was involved in the writing of the European Guidelines. Luke is currently involved in the ICEBP with AMSEC and other subcommittees. He has interest in databases and clinical guidelines. He is also a reviewer for JECT and Perfusion and other journals and has recently relocated to the US and is currently in respiratory therapy school. Um, and Luke is very well known for his work as the editor of Tiny Perfusion Letters. Please help me to welcome Luke, who's going to talk about hematic integrate repriming. Thank you so much for this nice uh, introduction. So I'm going to talk about this uh, technique uh, for which I, uh, I um, Richard asked me to, to give the presentation. I never did it. Uh, I, I didn't think of the idea, but I was involved in writing the articles, and I will explain how that, how that went. But first of all, I want to thank the, the organizing committee and, and everyone at Epic Cardiovascular Staffing who make this, this wonderful uh, meeting uh, possible and, and give us a platform to, to let loose our, our uh, desires with, with regards to meetings, uh, to who we want to hear speak. Okay, no uh, conflicts of interest. And I'm going to give you some background and concept about this technique, uh, describe the circuit, um, and then show some outcomes and, and future work, and hopefully come to some conclusions. So, shocker, I, I opened the newspaper today, and this is what, what the news said today, that CPB is bad for you. Um, and. You know, we, we all know what, what's happening when you put a patient on CPB. There's inflammation. Sometimes we need to give blood. There's blood-air interface and all that, all that thing, embolic emboli. And there's also some economic incentives to this, to this technique uh, that, that they then developed. Um, because remember the 2008 fi financial crisis uh, that hit Spain? Uh, in the south of Europe very hard and even years years after like people had to find ways to to save money and so in I'm not going to try to pronounce that because I would splatter the first line of uh, people um, so in in a, in a ho uh, hospital in in Murcia in Spain there was this uh, perfusionist that that wanted to develop a technique that could save uh, money could save blood could save transfusion uh, for his patients, and for those who don't know where Spain is, for the geographically challenged, it's on the 
on the side of uh, Europe, and it's always uh, the weather is always good there. Uh, and this is the the perfusionist Juan Blanco Murillo, and he he said uh, to himself like uh, I I need to develop a, a, a new technique to to manage uh, my patients. And so the first thing he did was a literature review. He looked at the clinical practice guidelines, and um, he he looked at you know the the, the ones we all know. European guidelines, uh, whatever there is, they have their own guidelines as well in, for, from Spain. And he then developed some some things that he wanted to introduce into into their uh, bypass. And they they didn't have a bad uh, cardio extracorporeal circuit. They they had a priming volume of around 1300, which is not too bad. Um, but they, they just simply needed to uh, reduce costs. That was their primary uh, driver. And, in, and Juan then said, like, well, I need to, while we're uh, reducing costs, I also want to uh, reduce complications and, and make it better for my patients. And the, where do you start with this? Well, he, he, he looked at how can I do, um, you know, how can I do um, uh, reduce my, my contact surface and, and how can I use autologous priming? And e even in the 60s, uh, they already started doing that. So in, this is a publication from the 60s, it's from Boston. Uh, and can anybody tell me when the first uh, heart-lung machine operation was done? Anybody? 1954, so six years after, thank you, I, I forgot that. So six years after the, um, the first uh, use of uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, they were already thinking about how can, reduce, how can we reduce the priming. And they, they, I had never seen this uh, machine. They used this uh, pulspirator, and it's a, it's a bubble oxygenator, and basically the, the blood comes uh, in the venous reservoir, and then oxygen is pushed, or gas is pushed through the through the blood, and um, the here the the pump underneath. Oh, you cannot see this. Just a second. Hope I'm not going to screw up. Okay. So the blood comes here in the venous reservoir, and then the the oxygen is pushed through it through the blood. And this pump is, is like two ventricles that are uh, driven by that oxygen that you push through the blood. So you, you literally could run this machine on without electricity. Uh, very clever, I would say. Uh, but anyway, they, they then, uh, a year later, they, they presented their, uh, their results. And they had only one 1,000 ml of priming, which is for that time it was remarkable. Uh, but this is probably only the the oxygenator and the pump, like all that tubing and everything was probably uh, ad additional uh, priming. And they used saline or dextran. Now I remember seeing uh, patients die from uh, getting dextran infused, uh, but nevertheless, and. In, in a good day, they only needed, they added 500 ml of uh, bank blood. And on average, they needed five units of blood uh, for the, for or five or six units of blood for their, uh, to prime their pump. Um, and then there, they had a lot of deaths because that's what happened in, that, in those days, you know. But luckily, they didn't, uh, they didn't, um, were, they said that they weren't related to the extracorporeal perfusion. So that's, that's good news. But as you can see, they had a total of 70 patients and eight of them, uh, eight, uh, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me, I lost my thread. So from the 70, 70 patients, I had eight deaths, which is about 11.5% mortality for ASDs, VSDs, and, and some valve pelvic surgery, but in spite of the 18 deaths, the 12 survivors were like uh, 
a grat gratifying salvage. So that's how it went in those days. And just uh, di digressing, uh, they were already talking about GDP in those days. The same, old, the same group uh, talked about fusion flow rate and uh, uh, pH. But they didn't look at hematocrit or anything. They just looked at DO2, at the oxygen content. And they saw that, you know, if you, if you flow too low, then you will uh, get uh, hyperlactatemia. Just a, a side note. So where to start? So Juan said, like, I need a MIAC system, minimal invasive, but I also need a reservoir. So it's a MIAC class four. Uh, I want to do autologous priming. I want to use uh, uh, vacuum assisted drainage. And, I want, and he wanted to do this in a standardized procedure that was reproducible for every patient. And they called it hematic integrate repriming. And you will soon see why it's repriming. So he described, and that's where I came in. They wanted to, they, they did the techniques and they got like a lot of patients done. And then they wanted to uh, publish the results, but they, they just had language barriers. And Juan called me and said like, do you want to help us? I, he explained me all the background and everything. And I, I thought he, it was a wonderful idea what he was doing. And I believed in it, so I helped him. Uh, because I had written this little paper in 2019, and he thought that I must maybe be uh, capable of writing something. And so uh, they have a mic system, very simple, you know, not too many uh, whistles and, and, uh, and bells. Uh, you have the, your venous line, which they can, uh, a reservoir, centri centrifugal pump, oxygenator, they have a recirculation line to their, like, standard uh, uh, reservoir, standard uh, configuration. Only they have from their arterial line, in their arterial line, they have a little line that goes back to the reservoir. Uh, that's what they added uh, into it. And so they have uh, six steps. First they prime it and whatever um, uh, priming they can get rid of, they, they push through to a bag. Then they empty their venous line. That was the only thing that was like, oh, that doesn't sound good. Uh, so while the surgeons are uh, cannulating, they empty the venous line. And then when, when the arterial, uh, uh, when the aortic cannula, sorry, is in, sorry, we tried to solve world problems yesterday uh, in the bar. We, I know we did a lot, but someone forget to write the solutions down. So I'm just a little, you know, a uh, little rough uh, morning. And so uh, when the aortic cannula is placed, they let they drain it through gravity, uh, and they call it uh, arterial displacement. And then, so they fill the reservoir again, then they empty it again, uh, and then they let the aortic... Uh, uh, they do aortic uh, wrap, but they don't do it through the oxygenator and the pump, but they just like let it drop in the, in the reservoir. They empty it again. And then the blood that they use, they, they don't just do the line, but they fill their reservoir again with blood from the patient. And then they prime their circuit again with the blood from the patient. And that's where the repriming comes from. And then that's a little detail that's gonna be uh, important later. And then they start to the pump with a dry venous line. And I was always like, you should not do that. That's crazy. But I will uh, also explain why I think it's, why I believe in it. I have a video, which is always very dangerous. Uh, yep, I got it. Look at this. It goes very fast and it's in Spanish. So I'm not going to try. This is, uh, they start their pump like around two, uh, 2,000 RPMs uh, to, to empty the, the reservoir, first step, like to go, to go down on the, then they empty the venous line through vacuum. They then cannulate and let the, let the arterial line uh, clear, the, they use that. Uh, 
priming, let it go out, then empty it again, and now they're uh, wrapping. And, and they feel like really, really good. And all the time it has co is coordination with anesthesiology. Uh, they give uh, boluses of epi, and they take a good amount of, uh, of uh, like three to 400 mLs, and then they start repriming their circuit into a bag, reducing hemodilution. This is like a commercial thing. And they, that's, that's for later, the embolic load is also diminished. And so they can take out um, about 700 uh, mLs this way, and so they literally have a priming volume of 300 and standardized for for most of their patients. I'm not going to say for every patient because, you know, they they will stop doing it if the if they cannot uh, sustain the, the arterial pressure um, or if the patient is, you know, in, in distress or they need to go uh, quickly on bypass. But it's all, whoops. How do I get out of it? Okay. So they avoid hypertension, avoid, they look at the nears, it shouldn't go down more than 15%, um, avoid hemodynamic uh, instability, avoid individualism, that means everybody's talking to each other, uh, the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and, and they all agree with the, it's like, a, it's not uh, Juan who went to the surgeon and said, you need to do this, they all uh, came together, you know, like, like a good leader. And avoid cavitation, they never go lower than 40 uh, millimeters of mercury of uh, vacuum assist. Okay. And so then uh, we, we started publishing because he wants to do his PhD in this. Um, and I, I was just involved in editing and then uh, looking at how they wanted to do the next uh, steps in, the, in their um, research and helping with that. But I never actually did the technique or went to Spain even, but that's in the pipeline. And so they did a first, so they already had a, a huge amount of patients. They, they, they did their uh, conventional ECC and then they started doing HAR. And the first publication was a propensity matching. Um, and so they, they compared 200, around 200 patients in each group. Um, there were no uh, significant differences within the groups, except for the, that there were more males in the HAR group uh, than in the control group, but this did not lead to a higher BSA or a, a higher hematocrit uh, preoperatively, so the patients were well matched, as you can see here in the in the uh, balancing of the preoperative value. So the variance rate is, is uh, close, close to one for uh, every parameter. I'm also not a statistician. Um, so they, they looked at um, then the results. So they looked at complications in this study and uh, transfusion and uh, mechanical ventilation longer than 10 hours was uh, significantly different. ICU stay longer than two days was lower. The, the amount uh, was lower. And all transfusion, except for platelets, uh, uh, after 24 hours was not uh, statistically significant, but was lower. And so overall, there was less transfusion, and they, they reached what they, what they needed to reach. Uh, their first goal was met. And then they said, okay, but we, we are doing something that is potentially dangerous. You know, we do uh, vacuum-assisted venous drainage, and we have a tri-venous line. And, and the group from uh, Timmy Wilcox in, in New Zealand had said, like, never do that because you create emboli, which you cannot get rid of. So they said, okay, we will, we will look at this. And they, they did another study. This time it was a, a randomized uh, controlled trial. So they, they did their study again. They uh, assigned patients to conventional ECC, which is the same circuit. They just, they just go on bypass in the normal, in the normal fashion. And then other people were uh, allocated to, to HAR. 
and they put some probes on there to measure the emboli to see if they did something wrong to the patient. Maybe they should have done it in the first place, but that's, that's uh, semantics, I guess. And what they saw was that, to their surprise, was that the, the number of emboli was, was, significant, was lower, not statistically significant, in the HAR group. So when they used the dry venous line, they had less emboli. And the volume of emboli, the big bubbles, were, were almost gone, were, were significantly lower. And so that, that was a, a surprising result for them, and they were, of course, happy with that. They, they even repeated uh, the, some of that research, which, will I, which I will show you later. Um, and the, they think, but they, they don't know for sure, that, but when you prime an oxygenator, there are some reports uh, that are unpublished, but that, are being, uh, that have been uh, in symposia, that when you prime your oxygenator according to the manufacturer's uh, recommendations, there will always be a little air left behind. And then the, their theory is that when they do their final step, the repriming with blood, which is a, of a higher density, that they push out those uh, emboli or the air that is left behind, that they then push it out of the, of the system and that's how they think they have lesser uh, emboli. But they haven't proven this yet. And then they, they said, okay, but we have less emboli. Are we still treating our patients well? So they did a third trial now, and these results are still under review. It's, it's, it has been sent to a, to a journal, but it got completely rejected the first time for reasons that I cannot comprehend, but anyway. Uh, they did the randomized controlled trial. 300 patients was the sample size that they projected, but they were going to evaluate after uh, a certain amount of uh, patients. And so, again, a randomized trial, they, they stopped after uh, 116 patients, and then they had some trouble with the measurements of the emboli uh, in this study. So they had to... Uh, well, not throw away patients, but throw away results. So they ended up with, a, with smaller groups. It was uh, <clears throat> 54 in the hard group and 59 in the, in the control group. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, they, these patients underwent uh, neurocognitive testing, the photo test, like they had to remember uh, four, four things they saw in a picture and then they had to re uh, recall what, what it said, clock drawing tests and visuospatial visual memory tests. Uh, for different, to look at different uh, cognitive functions. And this was done on baseline, early postoperative, uh, that means two days after ICU uh, stay, uh, after leaving the ICU, and then after uh, three months, they uh, went to those patients again. <coughs> um, there was no sig significant difference uh, preoperatively between those patients, uh, also not in the in the testing that they did. So the baseline testing was was similar for all these patients. These were all valvular patients, uh, and then the two-day performance, the cognitive performance after two days. This is the difference with the baseline, and so the blue is the is the control group, red is the heart group. And so the, 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 the control group had a higher difference uh, in their uh, neurocognitive function after two days. And, but it was only uh, statistically significant in uh, TRO is the, the, the clock drawing test. Um, so the, they all, the, both groups had some cognitive uh, um, deficiency, like as probably all patients have, but it was more in the control group than in the heart group. And then after three months, the results were like literally uh, very significantly different. So the heart group did remarkably better. Uh, 
than the control group. And they tried to find uh, causation, but they could only see correlation between the number of emboli or the volume of emboli that was uh, shot to the patients. And I'm, and I'm really talking about small amounts, but they are there. But the, there was a little correlation, but it wasn't statistically significant to, to prove that it was that number of, or volume of emboli. So in the future, they are, uh, they, uh, so Juan told me that the, the fact that he made it a standardized procedure is that he can easily teach it to a different group or a different center and so make, so make it, um, so that he can do multicentric studies. He has big plans, which is good. Uh, and he's also, and so he's working on a, on a model to train it to people. He has now a video model, but he also wants to make like a, a virtual reality model. Uh, so you can teach it uh, to another center, but they can teach it. They don't have to travel and stuff like that. And so to conclude, so for a certain group of patients undergoing cardiac surgery in your center, uh, this technique, this hematic integrate repriming technique can offer a standardized cost saving method. They, they did a cost saving and they, they estimated that they save around $2,700 per patient if they do it to, and that was for the second, uh, they did it in the second uh, study, this cost analysis. Uh, so you reduce your priming load to 300 mLs, you can reduce transfusions, the insult of CPB, they, they, they saw that they had less complications, and they attribute that to the slow controlled start, so it's not because they uh, their venous line is, is dry, but they don't just like suck it out of the patient. They do it controlled and then they, their, their arterial line is, is, uh, is already bloody. And so the, the, they don't have this uh, crystalloid uh, emboli that you embolize. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. Okay. And, and we, we saw that in our, in our center as well. We never studied it. But when we started, we, it took us three, four minutes to get, to get the patient on the pump, an adult patient. And if we, did, if we had to go fast, then we saw our nerves go down very, very fast. And, and you just destroy your, your microcirculation. So there's some, some research done on that. And so you uh, reduce your uh, post-operative cognitive dysfunction. Any complications, I said that. And so here's the, the genius behind all this. He, according to Bharat, uh, he's a true leader. Like he, he connected to me first and then he, I connected to him. And so we corrected each other. And then uh, he has a, he, when I, when I, when uh, Richard told me like, can you give this presentation? I was like, I have to ask Juan if he's okay with this because it's his research. Juan said like, I trust you completely. You can, you can, can do this and I let him down because uh, yesterday it was too harsh <laughs> but anyway I think I hope I conveyed the message thank you very much thanks Luke um, we'll take a few questions What do you do with the uh, prime drugs? With the, sorry, with the, the prime? prime drugs. So are you chasing all of them out or do you infuse them essentially in the beginning and then with the repriming, how, how does that work? So they, they just put heparin in a prime. You but don't prime with albumin or anything else? No. Okay. It's plasmalite and heparin and the least, it's, it's constant. So it's a, a certain amount of heparin in the priming but if you have less priming, then you just have less heparin because you give them both anyway. Um, do they think of uh, comparing it not only to control group, but also just conventional wrapping to see how, you know, how they differ? Uh, no, they did not because they, uh, they thought about doing that. But they said like the, the, the technique that they propose is like 
so standardized that that was their key one of the key things that they wanted to do was to make it standardized so um they wanted to compare the whole package to to something and not just that there has been trials that that looked at uh autologous priming but all that research is is uh like all the other research it's heterogeneous so you know they they just wanted to start something completely new. Yep. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you. My question is in a control group, I see a centrifugal pump. Do you think a roller pump will make a difference in emboli in your control group versus a kinetic pump? Mm, good question. But do you mean like... The, in your, in your control group when you're not doing all this? If you just had a roller pump instead of a centrifugal pump, you might not actually have that much emboli with the VAVD and all that. Hmm. Um, why would that be that you have less emboli? Because, because it's an occlusive pump. So you're sh sure that you're going to push I'm not, them through? I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, is it going to be less? I don't think so. Okay. I, it, in, my, in my opinion, I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, centrifugal pumps will stop the emboli. Not, not like it's not uh, a Medtronic uh, Biomedicus. They they stopped some of the of the emboli, uh, but I I don't think that would make a difference. To be honest, with the roller pump, it would not make a difference. Yeah, it might, but they didn't try it. We just have a, one quick question from online chat. Which, well, two questions really linked is how many people here actually do wrap as part of their normal practice. So probably the majority, yeah. yeah. And within that, who thinks about wrapping their cardioplegia circuit? Mm -hmm. So a few. That's interesting. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. This is true. Yeah, I don't. I I forgot to look, but I don't, I cannot recall what what kind of cardioplegia they used. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.